Chapter Seven of Cleopatra by Georg Gebers, translated by Mary J. Safford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Archibius had buried himself so deeply in the past that it was several minutes ere he could bring himself back to the present. When he did so, he hastily discussed with the two ladies the date of their departure it was hard for berenike to leave her injured brother and barine longed to see dion once more before the journey both were reluctant to quit alexandria ere decisive news had arrived from the army and the fleet so they requested a few days delay but archibius cut them short requiring them with a resolution which transformed the amiable friend into a stern master to be ready for the journey the next day at sunset his nile boat would await them at the agathodemon harbour on lake mariatus and his travelling chariot would convey them thither with as much luggage and as many female slaves as they desired to take with them then softening his tone he briefly reminded the ladies of the great annoyances to which a longer stay would expose them excused his rigour on the plea of haste pressed the hands of the mother and daughter and retired without heeding barine who called after him yet could desire nothing save to plead for a longer delay the carriage bore him swiftly to the great harbour the waxing moon was mirrored like a silver column now wavering and tremulous now rent by the waves tossing under a strong south-east wind and illumined the warm autumn night the sea outside was evidently running high this was apparent by the motion of the vessels lying at anchor in the angle which the shore in front of the superb temple of poseidon formed with the coma this was a tongue of land stretched like a finger into the sea on whose point stood a little palace which cleopatra incited by a chance remark of antony had had built there to surprise him another of white marble glimmered in the moonlight from the island of antirodus and farther still a blazing fire illumined the darkness its flames flared from the top of the famous lighthouse on the island of pharos at the entrance of the harbour and swayed to and fro by the wind steeped the horizon and the outer edge of the dark water in the harbour with moving masses of light which irradiated the gloomy distance sometimes faintly anon more brilliantly spite of the late hour the harbour was full of bustle though the wind often blew the men's cloaks over their heads and the women were obliged to gather their garments closely around them true at this hour commerce had ceased but many had gone to the port in search of news or even to greet before others the first ship returning from the victorious fleet for that antony had defeated octavianus in a great battle was deemed certain guards were watching the harbour and a band of syrian horsemen had just passed from the barracks in the southern part of the lochius to the temple of poseidon here the galleys lay at anchor not in the harbour of eunostus which was separated from the other by the broad bridge-like dam of the heptastadium that united the city and the island of pharos near it were the royal palaces and the arsenal and any tidings must first reach this spot the other harbour was devoted to commerce but in order to prevent the spread of false reports newly arrived ships were forbidden to enter true even at the great harbour news could scarcely be expected for a chain stretching from the end of the pharos to a cliff directly opposite in the alvius Deganus, closed the narrow opening but it could be raised if a state galley arrived with an important message and this was expected by the throng on the shore doubtless many came from banquets cookshops taverns or the nocturnal meeting-places of the sects that practised the magic arts yet the weight of anxious expectation seemed to check the joyous activity and wherever archibius glanced he beheld eager troubled faces the wind forced many to bow their heads and wherever they turned their eyes flags and clouds of dust were fluttering in the air increasing the confusion 
as the galley put off from the shore and the flute summoned the oarsmen to their toil its owner felt so disheartened that he did not even venture to hope that he was going in quest of good tidings long vanished days had as it were been called from the grave and many a scene from the past rose before him as he lay among the cushions on the poop gazing at the sky across which dark swiftly sailing clouds sometimes veiled the stars and again revealed them how much we can conceal by words without being guilty of falsehood he murmured while recalling what he had told the women ay he had been cleopatra's confidant in his early youth but how he had loved her how even as a boy he had been subject to her body and soul he had allowed her to see it displayed confessed it and she had accepted it as her rightful due she had repelled with angry pride his only attempt to clasp her in his overflowing affection in his arms but to show his love for her is a crime for which the loftiest woman pardons the humblest suitor and a few hours later cleopatra had met him with the old affectionate familiarity again he recalled the torments which he had endured when compelled to witness how completely she yielded to the passion which drew her to antony at that time the roman had merely swept through her life like a swiftly passing meteor but many things betrayed that she did not forget him and while archibius had seen without pain her love for the great caesar bud and grow the torturing feeling of jealousy again stirred in his heart though youth was past when at tarsus on the river sidnus she renewed the bond which still united her to antony now his hair had grown gray and though nothing had clouded his friendship for the queen though he had always been ready to serve her this foolish feeling had not been banished and again and again mastered his whole being he by no means undervalued antony's attractions but he saw his foibles no less clearly all in all whenever he thought of this pair he felt like the lover of art who entrusts the finest gem in his collection to a rich man who knows not how to prize its real value and puts it in the wrong place yet he wished the roman the most brilliant victory for his defeat would have been cleopatra's also and would she endure the consequences of such a disaster the galley was approaching the flickering circle of light at the foot of the pharos and archibius was just producing the token which was to secure the lifting of the chain when his name echoed through the stillness of the night it was dion hailing him from a boat tossing near the mouth of the harbour on the waves surging in from the turbulent sea he had recognized archibius's swift galley from the bust of epicurus which was illumined by the light of the lantern in the prow cleopatra had had it placed upon the ship which by her orders had been built for her friend dion now desired to join him and was soon standing on the deck at his side he had landed on the island of pharos and entered a sailor's tavern to learn what was passing but no one could give him any definite information for the wind was blowing from the land and allowed large vessels to approach the egyptian coast only by the aid of oars shortly before the breeze had veered from south to southeast and an experienced rhodian would never again lift cup of wine to his lips if it did not blow from the north to-morrow or the day after then ships bearing news might reach alexandria by the dozen that is the greybeard added with a defiant glance at the daintily clad city gentlemen if they were allowed to pass the pharos or go through the poseidon basin into the eunostus he had fancied that he saw sails on the horizon at sunset but the swiftest galley became a hedgehog when the wind blew against its prow and even checked the oars others too had fancied that they had seen sails and dion would gladly have gone out to sea to investigate but he was entirely alone in a frail hired boat and this would not have been permitted to pass beyond the harbour the expectation that every road would be open to archibius had not deceived him and the harbour chain was drawn aside for the epicurus with swelling sails urged by the strong wind blowing from the southeast its keel cut the rolling waves 
soon a faint tremulous light appeared in the north it must be a ship and though the helmsman in the tavern at pharos who looked as though he had not always steered peaceful trading vessels had spoken of some which did not let the ships they caught pass unscathed the men on the well-equipped stately epicurus did not fear pirates especially as morning was close at hand and it had just shot by two clumsy men of war which had been sent out by the regent the strong wind filled every sail rowing would have been useless labour and the light in front seemed to be coming nearer a wan glimmer was already beginning to brighten the distant east when the epicurus approached the vessel with the light but it seemed to wish to avoid the alexandrian and turned suddenly towards the northeast archibius and dion now discussed whether it would be worth while to pursue the fugitive it was a small ship which as the dark masses of clouds became bordered with golden edges grew more distinct and appeared to be a cilician pirate of the smallest size as to its crew the tried sailors on the epicurus a much larger vessel which lacked no means of defence showed no signs of alarm the helmsman especially who had served in the fleet of sextus pompey and had sprung upon the deck of many a pirate ship archibius deemed it foolish to commence a conflict unnecessarily but dion was in the mood to brave every peril if life and death were at stake so much the better he had informed his friend of iris's fears the fleet must be in a critical situation and if the little cilician had had nothing to conceal she would not have shunned the epicurus it was worth while to learn what had induced her to turn back just before reaching the harbour the warlike helmsman also desired to give chase and archibius yielded for the uncertainty was becoming more and more unbearable dion's soul was deeply burdened too he could not banish barine's image and since archibius had told him that he had found her resolved to shut her house against guests and how willingly she had accepted his invitation to the country again and again he pondered over the question what should prevent his marrying the quiet daughter of a distinguished artist whom he loved archibius had remarked that barine would be glad to greet her most intimate friends among whom he was included in her quiet country dion did not doubt this but he was equally sure that the greeting would bind him to her and rob him of his liberty perhaps for ever but would the alexandrian possess the lofty gift of freedom if the romans ruled his city as they governed carthage or corinth if cleopatra were defeated and egypt became a roman province a share in the business of the council which was still addressed as macedonian men and which was dear to dion could offer nothing but humiliation and no longer afford satisfaction if a pirate's spear put an end to bondage under the roman yoke and to this unworthy yearning and wavering so much the better on this autumn morning under this grey sky from which sank a damp light fog with these hopes and fears in his heart he beheld in both the present and future naught save shadows the epicurus overtook and captured the fugitive the slight resistance the vessel might have offered was relinquished when archibius's helmsman shouted that the epicurus did not belong to the royal navy and had come in search of news the cilician took in his oars archibius and dion entered the vessel and questioned the commander he was an old weather-beaten seaman who would give no information until after he had learned what his pursuers really desired at first he protested that he had witnessed on the peloponnesian coast a great victory gained by the egyptian galleys over those commanded by octavianus but the queries of the two friends involved him in contradictions and he then pretended to know nothing and to have spoken of a victory merely to please the alexandrian gentlemen dion accompanied by a few men from the crew of the epicurus searched the ship and found in the little cabin a man bound and gagged guarded by one of the pirates it was a sailor from the pontus who spoke only his native language nothing intelligible could be obtained from him but there were important suggestions in a letter found in a chest in the cabin among clothing jewels and other stolen articles the letter dion could scarcely believe his own eyes was addressed to his friend the architect gorgias the pirate being ignorant of writing had not opened it but dion tore the wax from the cord without delay aristocrates the greek rhetorician who had accompanied antony to the war had written from 
tenarum in the south of the peloponnesus requesting the architect in the general's name to set the little palace at the end of the coma in order and surround it on the land side with a high wall no door would be necessary communication with the dwelling could be had by water he must do his utmost to complete the work speedily the friends gazed at each other in astonishment as they read this commission what could induce antony to give so strange an order how did it fall into the hands of the pirates this must be understood when archibius whose gentle nature so well adapted to inspire confidence quickly won friends burst into passionate excitement the unexpected transition rarely failed to produce its effect especially as his tall strong figure and marked features made a still more threatening impression even the captain gazed at him with fear when the alexandrian threatened to recall all his promises of consideration and mercy if the pirate withheld even the smallest trifle connected with this letter the man speedily perceived that it would be useless to make false statements for the captive from pontus though unable to speak greek understood the language and either confirmed every remark of the other with vehement gestures or branded it in the same manner as false thus it was discovered that the pirate craft in company with a much larger vessel owned by a companion had lurked behind the promontory of crete for a prize they had neither seen nor heard aught concerning the two fleets when a dainty galley the finest and fleetest that ever sailed in the sea it was probably the swallow antony's dispatch boat had run into the snare to capture her was an easy task the pirates had divided their booty but the lion's share of goods and men had fallen to the larger ship a pouch containing letters and money had been taken from a gentleman of aristocratic appearance probably antony's messenger who had received a severe wound died and had been flung into the sea the former had been used to light the fire and only the one addressed to the architect remained the captured sailors had said that the fleet of octavianus had defeated cleopatra's and the queen had fled but that the land forces were still untouched and might yet decide the conflict in antony's favour the pirate protested that he did not know the position of the army it might be at tenarum whence the captured ship came it was a sin and a shame but his own crew had set it on fire and it sank before his eyes this report seemed to be true yet the arcarnanian coast where the battle was said to have been fought was so far from the southern point of the peloponnesus whence antony's letter came that it must have been written during the flight one thing appeared to be certain the fleet had been vanquished and dispersed on the second or third of september where would the queen go now what had become of the magnificent galleys which had accompanied her to the battle even the contrary winds would not have detained them so long for they were abundantly supplied with rowers had octavianus taken possession of them were they burned or sunk but in that case how had antony reached te narum the pirate could give no answer to these questions which stirred both heart and brain why should he conceal what had reached his ears at last archibius ordered the property stolen from antony's ship and the liberated sailor to be brought on board the epicurus but the pirate was obliged to swear not to remain in the waters between crete and alexandria then he was suffered to pursue his way unmolested this adventure had occupied many hours and the return against the wind was slow for during the chase the epicurus had been carried by the strong breeze far out to sea yet when still several miles from the mouth of the harbour at the pharos it was evident that the rhodian helmsman in the island tavern had predicted truly for the weather changed with unusual speed and the wind now blew from the north the sea fairly swarmed with ships some belonging to the royal fleet some to curious alexandrians who had sailed out to take a survey archibius and dion had spent a sleepless night and day the heavy air pervaded by a fine mist had grown cool after refreshing themselves by a repast they paced up and down the deck of the epicurus few words were exchanged and they wrapped their cloaks closer around them both had quaffed large draughts of the fiery wine with which the epicurus was well supplied 
but it would not warm them even the fire blazing brightly in the richly furnished cabin could scarcely do so archibius's thoughts lingered with his beloved queen and his vivid power of imagination conjured before his mind everything which could distress her no possible chance not even the most terrible was forgotten and when he saw her sinking in the ship stretching her beautiful arms imploringly towards him to whom she had so long turned in every perilous position when he beheld her a captive in the presence of the hostile cold-hearted octavianus the blood seemed to freeze in his veins at last he dropped his felt mantle and groaning aloud struck his brow with his clenched hand he had fancied her walking with gold chains on her slender wrists before the victor's four-horse chariot and heard the exulting shouts of the roman populace that would have been the most terrible of all to pursue this train of thought was beyond the endurance of the faithful friend and dion turned in surprise as he heard him sob and saw the tears which bedewed his face his own heart was heavy enough but he knew his companion's warm devotion to the queen so passing his arm around his shoulder he entreated him to maintain that peace of soul and mind which he had so often admired in the most critical situations he had seen him stand high above them as yonder man who fed the flames on the summit of the pharos stood above the wild surges of the sea if he would reflect over what had happened as dispassionately as usual he could not fail to see that antony must be free and in a position to guide his own future since he directed the palace in the coma to be put in order he did not understand about the wall but perhaps he was bringing home some distinguished captive whom he wished to debar from all communication with the city it might prove that everything was far better than they feared and they would yet smile at these grievous anxieties his heart too was heavy for he wished the queen the best fortune not only for her own sake but because with her and her successful resistance to the greed of rome was connected the liberty of alexandria my love and anxiety like yours he concluded have ever been given to her the sovereign of this country the world will be desolate life will no longer be worth living if the iron foot of rome crushes our independence and freedom the words had sounded cordial and sincere and archibius followed dion's counsel calm thought convinced him that nothing had yet happened which compelled belief in the worst result and as one who needs consolation often finds relief in comforting another archibius cheered his own heart by representing to his younger friend that even if octavianus were the victor and should deprive egypt of her independence he would scarcely venture to take from the citizens of alexandria the free control of their own affairs then he explained to dion that as a young resolute independent man he might render himself doubly useful if it were necessary to guard the endangered liberty of the city and told him how many beautiful things life still held in store his voice expressed anxious tenderness for his young friend no one had spoken thus to dion since his father's death the epicurus would soon reach the mouth of the harbour and after landing he must again leave archibius the decisive hour which often unites earnest men more firmly than many previous years had come to both they had opened their hearts to each other dion had withheld only the one thing which at the first sight of the houses in the city filled his soul with fresh uneasiness it was long since he had sought counsel from others many who had asked his had left him with thanks to do exactly the opposite of what he had advised though it would have been to their advantage more than once he too had done the same but now a powerful impulse urged him to confide in archibius he knew barine and wished her the greatest happiness perhaps it would be wise to let another person who was kindly disposed consider what his own heart so eagerly demanded and prudence forbade hastily forming his resolution he again turned to his friend saying you have shown yourself a father to me imagine that i am indeed your son and as such wish to confess that a woman had become dear to my heart and to ask whether you would be glad to greet her as a daughter here archibius interrupted him with the exclamation a ray of light amid all this gloom 
grasp what you have too long neglected as soon as possible it befits a good citizen to marry the greek does not attain full manhood till he becomes husband and father if i have remained unwedded there was a special reason for it and how often i have envied the cobbler whom i saw standing before his shop in the evening holding his child in his arms or the pilot to whom large and small hands were stretched in greeting when he returned home when i enter my dwelling only my dogs rejoice but you whose beautiful palace stands empty to whose proud family it is due that you should provide for its continuance that is just what brings me into a state of indecision which is usually foreign to my nature interrupted dion you know me and my position in the world and you have also known from her earliest childhood the woman to whom i allude iris asked his companion hesitatingly his sister charmian had told him of the love felt by the queen's younger waiting woman but dion eagerly denied this adding i am speaking of barine the daughter of your dead friend leonax i love her yet my pride is sensitive and i know that it will extend to my future wife the contemptuous glances which others might cast at her i should scorn for i know her worth surely you remember my mother she was a very different woman her house her child the slaves her loom were everything to her she rigidly exacted from other women the chaste reserve which was a marked trait in her own character yet she was gentle and loved me her only son beyond aught else i think she would have opened her arms to barine had she believed that she was necessary to my happiness but would the young beauty accustomed to gay intercourse with distinguished men have been able to submit to her demands when i consider that she cannot help taking into her married life the habit of being surrounded and courted when i think that the imprudence of a woman accustomed to perfect freedom might set idle tongues in motion and cast a shadow upon the radiant purity of my name when i even and he raised his clenched right hand but archibius answered soothingly that anxiety is groundless if barine warmly and joyfully gives you her whole heart it is a sunny lovable true woman's heart and therefore capable of a great love if she bestows it on you and i believe she will go and offer sacrifices in your gratitude for the immortals desired your happiness when they guided your choice to her and not to iris my own sister's child if you were really my son i would now exclaim you could not bring me a dearer daughter if i repeated if you are sure of her love dion gazed into vacancy a short time and then cried firmly i am end of chapter seven chapter eight of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the epicurus anchored before the temple of poseidon the crew had been ordered to keep silence though they knew nothing except that a letter from antony commanding the erection of a wall had been found on board the pirate this might be regarded as a good omen for people do not think of building unless they anticipate a time of peace the light rain had ceased but the wind blew more strongly from the north and the air had grown cool a dense throng still covered the quay from the southern end of the heptastadium to the promontory of lochius the strongest pressure was between the peninsula of the coma and the sebasteum for this afforded a view of the sea and the first tidings must reach the residence of the regent which was connected with the palace a hundred contradictory rumours had been in circulation that morning and when at the third hour in the afternoon the epicurus arrived it was surrounded by a dense multitude eager to hear what news the ship had brought from without other vessels shared the same fate but none could give reliable tidings two swift galleys from the royal fleet reported meeting a samian trireme which had given news of a great victory gained by antony on the land and cleopatra on the sea and as men are most ready to believe what they desire throngs of exulting men and women moved to and fro along the shore strengthening by their confidence many a timorous spirit 
prudent people who had regarded the long delay of the first ships of the fleet with anxiety had opened their ears to the tales of evil and looked forward to the future with uneasiness but they avoided giving expression to their fears for the overseer of an establishment for gold embroidery who had ventured to warn the people against premature rejoicing had limped home badly beaten and two other pessimists who had been flung in the sea had just been dragged out dripping wet nor could the multitude be blamed for this confidence for at the serapium the theatre of dionysus the lofty pylons of the sebasteum the main door of the museum in front of the entrance of the palace in the bruchium and before the fortress-like palaces in the lochius triumphal arches had been erected adorned with gods of victory and trophies hastily constructed of plaster inscriptions of congratulations and thanks to the deities garlands of foliage and flowers the wreathing of the egyptian pylons and obelisks the principal temple and the favourite statues in the city had been commenced during the night the last touches were now being given to the work gorgias like his friend dion had not closed his eyes since the night before for he had had charge of all the decorations of the bruchium where one superb building adjoined another sleep had also fled from the couches of the occupants of the sebasteum the, the royal palace where iris lived during the absence of the queen and the praetorium facing its southern front which contained the official residence of the regent when archibius was conducted to the queen's waiting-woman her appearance fairly startled him she had been his guest in canopus only the day before yesterday and how great was the alteration within this brief time her oval face seemed to have lengthened the features to have grown sharper and this woman of seven-and-twenty years who had hitherto retained all the charms of youth appeared suddenly to have aged a decade there was a feverish excitement in her manner as holding out her hand to her uncle in greeting she exclaimed hastily you too bring no good tidings nor any evil ones he answered quietly but child i do not like your appearance the dark circles under your keen eyes you have had news which rouses your anxiety worse than that she answered in a low tone well read gasped iris her lips and nostrils quivering as she handed archibius a small tablet with a gesture of haste very unusual in him he snatched it from her hand and as his eyes ran over the words traced upon it every vestige of colour vanished from his cheeks and lips they were written by cleopatra's own hand and contained the following lines the naval battle was lost and by my fault the land forces might still save us but not under his command he is with me uninjured but apparently exhausted like a different being bereft of courage listless as if utterly crushed i foresee the beginning of the end as soon as this reaches you arrange to have some unpretending litters ready for us every evening at sunset make the people believe that we have conquered until trustworthy intelligence arrives concerning the fate of canidius and the army when you kiss the children in my name be very tender with them who knows how soon they may be orphaned they already have an unhappy mother may they be spared the memory of a cowardly one trust no one except those whom i left in authority and archibius not even caesarion or antyllus provide for having every one whose aid may be valuable to me within reach when i come i cannot close with the familiar rejoice the fresh courage placed on many a tombstone seems more appropriate you who did not envy me in my happiness will help me to bear misfortune epicurus who believes that the gods merely watch the destiny of men inactively from their blissful heights is right were it otherwise how could the love and loyalty which cleave to the hapless defeated woman be repaid with anguish of heart and tears yet continue to love her archibius pale and silent let the tablet fall it was long ere he gasped hoarsely i foresaw it yet now that it is here 
his voice failed and violent tearless sobs shook his powerful frame sinking on a couch he buried his face amid the cushions iris gazed at the strong man and shook her head she too loved the queen the news had brought tears to her eyes also but even while she wept a host of plans coping with this disaster had darted through her restless brain a few minutes after the arrival of the message of misfortune she had consulted with the members of cleopatra's council and adopted measures for sustaining the people's belief in the naval victory what was she the delicate by no means courageous girl compared to this man of iron strength who she was well aware had braved the greatest perils in the service of the queen yet there he lay with his face hidden in the pillows as if utterly overwhelmed did a woman's soul rebound more quickly after being crushed beneath the burdens of the heaviest suffering or was hers of a special character and her slender body the casket of a hero's nature she had reason to believe so when she recalled how the regent and the keeper of the seal had received the terrible news they had rushed frantically up and down the vast hall as if desperate but mardian the eunuch had little manhood and zeno was a characterless old author who had won the queen's esteem and the high office which he occupied solely by the vivid power of imagination that enabled him constantly to devise new exhibitions amusements and entertainments and present them with magical splendour but archibius the brave circumspect counsellor and helper his shoulders again quivered as if they had received a blow and iris suddenly remembered what she had long known but never fully realised that yonder grey-haired man loved cleopatra loved her as she herself loved dion and she wondered whether she would have been strong enough to maintain her composure if she had learned that a cruel fate threatened to rob him of life liberty and honour hour after hour she had vainly awaited the young alexandrian yet he had witnessed her anxiety the day before had she offended him was he detained by the spell of didymus's granddaughter it seemed a great wrong that amid the unspeakably terrible misfortune which had overtaken her mistress she could not refrain from thinking continually of dion even as his image filled her heart cleopatra's ruled her uncle's mind and soul and she said to herself that it was not alone among women that love paid no heed to years or whether the locks were brown or tinged with grey but archibius now raised himself left the couch passed his hand across his brow and in the deep calm tones natural to his voice began with a sorrowful smile a man stricken by an arrow leaves the fray to have his wound bandaged the surgeon has now finished his task i ought to have spared you this pitiable spectacle child but i am again ready for the battle cleopatra's account of antony's condition renders a piece of news which we have just received somewhat more intelligible we replied iris who was your companion dion answered archibius but when he was about to describe the incidents of the preceding night she interrupted him with the question whether barine had consented to leave the city he assented with a curt yes but iris assumed the manner of having expected nothing different and requested him to continue his story archibius now related everything which they had experienced and their discovery in the pirate ship dion was even now on the way to carry antony's order to his friend gorgias any slave might have attended to that matter equally well iris remarked in an irritated tone i should think he would have more reason to expect trustworthy tidings here but that's the way with men here she hesitated but meeting an inquiring glance from her uncle she went on eagerly nothing i believe binds them more firmly to one another than mutual pleasure but that must now be over they will seek other amusements whether with heliodora or thais i care not if the woman had only gone before when she caught young caesarion stay child her uncle interrupted reprovingly i know how much she would rejoice if antyllus had never brought the boy to her house now because the poor deluded lad's infatuation alarms her no from his first visit immature boys do not suit the distinguished men whom she receives 
if the door is always kept open thieves will enter the house she received only old acquaintances and the friends whom they presented her house was closed to all others so there was no trouble with thieves but who in alexandria could venture to refuse admittance to a son of the queen there is a wide difference between quiet admittance and fanning a passion to madness wherever a fire is burning there has certainly been a spark to kindle it you men do not detect such women's work a glance a pressure of the hand even the light touch of a garment and the flame blazes where such inflammable material lies ready we lament the violence of the conflagration you are not well disposed towards barine i care no more for her than this couch here cares for the statue of mercury in the street exclaimed iris with repellent arrogance there could be no two things in the world more utterly alien than we between the woman whose door stands open and me there is nothing in common save our sex and replied archibius reprovingly many a beautiful gift which the gods bestowed upon her as well as upon you as for the open door it was closed yesterday the thieves of whom you spoke spoiled her pleasure in granting hospitality antyllus forced himself with noisy impetuosity into her house this made her dread still more unprecedented conduct in the future in a few hours she will be on the way to irenia i am glad for caesarion's sake and still more for his mother's whom we have wronged by forgetting so long for another to think that we should be forced to do so cried iris excitedly now at this hour when every drop of blood every thought of this poor brain should belong to the queen yet it could not be avoided cleopatra is returning to us with a heart bleeding from a hundred wounds and it is terrible to think that a new arrow must strike her as soon as she steps upon her native soil you know how she loves the boy who is the living image of the great man with whom she shared the highest joys of love when she learns that he the son of caesar has given his young heart to the cast-off wife of a street orator a woman whose home attracted men as ripe dates lure birds it will be i know like rubbing salt into her fresh wounds alas and the one sorrow will not be all antony her husband also found the way to barine he sought her more than once you cannot know it as i do but charmian will tell you how sensitive she has become since the flower of her youthful charms you don't perceive it is losing one leaf after another jealousy will torture her and i know her well perhaps no one will ever render the siren a greater service than i did when i compelled her to leave the city the eyes of archibius's clever niece had glittered with such hostile feeling as she spoke that he thought with just anxiety of his dead friend's daughter what did not yet threaten barine as serious danger iris had the power to transform into grave peril dion had begged him to maintain strict secrecy but even had he been permitted to speak he would not have done so now from his knowledge of iris's character she might be expected if she learned that some one had come between her and the friend of her youth to shrink from no means of spoiling her game he remembered the noble macedonian maiden whom the queen had begun to favour and who was hunted to death by iris's hostile intrigues few were more clever and if she once loved more loyal and devoted more yielding pliant and in happy hours more bewitching yet even in childhood she had preferred a winding path to a straight one it seemed as if her shrewdness scorned to attain the end desired by the simple method lying close at hand how willingly his mother and his younger sister charmian had cared for the slaves and nursed them when they were ill nay charmian had gained in her nubian maid anukis a friend who would have gone to death for her sake cleopatra too when a child had found sincere delight in taking a bouquet to his parents sick old housekeeper and sitting by her bedside to shorten the time for her with merry talk she had gone to her unasked while iris had often been punished because she had made the lives of numerous slaves in her parents household still harder by unreasonable harshness this trait in her character had roused her uncle's anxiety and in after years 
her treatment of her inferiors had been such that he could not number her among the excellent of her sex therefore he was the more joyfully surprised by the loyal unselfish love with which she devoted herself to the service of the queen cleopatra had gratified charmian's wish to have her niece for an assistant and iris who had never been a loving daughter to her own faithful mother had served her royal mistress with the utmost tenderness archibius valued this loyalty highly but he knew what awaited any one who became the object of her hatred and the fear that it would involve barine in urgent peril was added to his still greater anxiety for cleopatra when about to depart burdened by the sorrowful conviction that he was powerless against his niece's malevolent purpose he was detained by the representation that every fresh piece of intelligence would first reach the sebasteum and her some question might easily arise which his calm prudent mind could decide far better than hers whose troubled condition resembled a shallow pool disturbed by stones flung into the waves the apartments of his sister charmian which were connected with his by a corridor were empty and iris begged him to remain there a short time the anxiety and dread that oppressed her heart would kill her to know that he was near would be the greatest comfort when archibius hesitated because he deemed it his duty to urge caesarion over whom he possessed some influence to give up his foolish wishes for his mother's sake iris assured him that he would not find the youth he had gone hunting with antyllus and some other friends she had approved the plan because it removed him from the city and barine's dangerous house as the queen does not wish him to know the terrible news yet she concluded his presence would only have caused us embarrassment so stay and when it grows dark go with us to the lochias i think it will please the sorrowing woman when she lands to see your familiar face which will remind her of happier days do me the favour to stay she held out both hands beseechingly as she spoke and archibius consented a repast was served and he shared it with his niece but iris did not touch the carefully chosen viands and archibius barely tasted them then without waiting for dessert he rose to go to his sister's apartments but iris urged him to rest on the divan in the adjoining room and he yielded yet spite of the softness of the pillows and his great need of sleep he could not find it anxiety kept him awake and through the curtain which divided the room in which iris remained from the one he occupied he sometimes heard her light footsteps pacing restlessly to and fro sometimes the coming and going of messengers in quest of news all his former life passed before his mind cleopatra had been his son and now black clouds were rising which would dim its light perchance for ever he the disciple of epicurus who had not followed the doctrines of other masters until later in life held the same view of the gods as his first master to him also they had seemed immortal beings sufficient unto themselves dwelling free from anxiety in blissful peace to whom mortals must look upward on account of their supreme grandeur but who neither troubled themselves about the guidance of the world which was fixed by eternal laws nor the fate of individuals had he been convinced of the contrary he would have sacrificed everything he possessed in order by lavish offerings to propitiate the immortals in behalf of her to whom he had devoted his life and every faculty of his being like iris he too could find no rest upon his couch and when she heard his step she called to him and asked why he did not recover the sleep which he had lost no one knew the demands the next night might make upon him you will find me awake he answered quietly then he went to the window which above the pylons that rose before the main front of the sebasteum afforded a view of the bruchium and the sea the harbour was now swarming with vessels of every size garlanded with flowers and adorned with gay flags and streamers the report of the successful issue of the first naval battle was believed and many desired to greet the victorious fleet and hail their sovereign as she entered the harbour 
many people equipages and litters had also gathered on the shore between the lofty pylons and the huge door of the sebasteum they were representatives of the aristocracy of the city for the majority were attended by richly attired slaves many wore costly garlands and numerous chariots and litters were adorned with gold or silver ornaments gems and glittering paste the stir and movement in front of the palace were ceaseless and iris who was now standing beside her uncle waved her hand towards it saying the wind of rumour yesterday only one or two came to-day every one who belongs to the inimitable livers flocks hither in person to get news the victory was proclaimed in the market-place at the theatre the gymnasium and the camp every one who wears garlands or weapons heard of a battle won yesterday among all the thousands there was scarcely a single doubter but to-day how does it happen even among those who as inimitables have shared all the pleasures entertainments and festivities of our noble pair faith wavers for if they were firmly convinced of the brilliant victory which was announced loudly enough they would not come themselves to watch to spy to listen just look down there is the litter of diogenes yonder that of ammonius the chariot beyond belongs to melampus the slaves in the red bombyx garments serve hermias they all belong to the society of inimitables and shared our banquets that very apollonius who for the last half hour has been trying to question the palace servants day before yesterday ordered fifty oxen to be slaughtered to ares nike and the great isis as the queen's goddess and when i met him in the temple he exclaimed that this was the greatest piece of extravagance he had ever committed for even without the cattle cleopatra and antony would be sure of victory but now the wind of rumour has swept away his beautiful confidence also they are not permitted to see me the doorkeepers say that i am in the country the necessity of showing every one a face radiant with the joy of victory would kill me there comes apollonius how his fat face beams he believes in the victory and after sunset none of yonder throng will appear here he is already giving orders to his slaves he will invite all his friends to a banquet and won't spare his costly wines capital at least no one from that company can disturb us dion is his cousin and will be present also we shall see what these pleasure lovers will do when they are forced to confront the terrible reality i think replied archibius they will afford the world a remarkable spectacle friends one in prosperity who remain constant in adversity do you asked iris with sparkling eyes if that proves true how i would praise and value men the majority of whom without their wealth would be poorer than beggars but look at yonder figure in the white robe beside the left obelisk is it not dion the crowd is bearing him away i think it was he but she had been deceived the man whom she fancied she had seen because her heart so ardently yearned for him was not near the sebasteum and his thoughts were still farther away at first he had intended to give the architect the letter which was addressed to him he would be sure to find him at the triumphal arch which was being erected on the shore of the bruchium but on reaching the former place he learned that gorgias had gone to remove the statues of cleopatra and antony from the house of didymus and erect them in front of the theatre of dionysus the regent mardion had ordered it gorgias was already superintending the erection of the foundation the huge hewn stones which he required for this purpose had been taken from the temple of nemesis which he was supervising whatever number of government slaves he needed were at his disposal so gorgias's foreman reported proudly adding that before the sun went down the architect would have shown the alexandrians the marvel of removing the twin statues from one place to another in a single day and yet establishing them as firmly as the colossus which had been in thebes a thousand years dion found the piece of sculpture in front of didymus's garden ready for removal but the slaves who had placed before the platform the rollers on which it was to be moved had already been kept waiting a long time by the architect this was his third visit to the old philosopher's house first he had been obliged to inform him and his family that their property was no longer in danger 
then he had come to tell them at what hour he would remove the statues which still attracted many curious spectators and finally he had again appeared to announce that they were to be taken away at once his foreman or a slave could probably have done this but helena didymus's granddaughter barine's sister drew him again and again to the old man's house he would gladly have come still more frequently for at every meeting he had discovered fresh charms in the beautiful quiet thoughtful maiden who cared so tenderly for her aged grandparents he believed that he loved her and she seemed glad to welcome him but this did not entitle him to seek her hand though his large empty house so greatly needed a mistress his heart had glowed with love for too many he wished first to test whether this new fancy would prove more lasting if he succeeded in remaining faithful even a few days he would as it were reward himself for it and appear before didymus as a suitor he excused his frequent visits to himself on the pretext of the necessity of becoming acquainted with his future wife and helena made the task easier for him the usual reserve of her manner lessened more and more nay the great confidence with which he at first inspired her was increased by his active assistance when he entered just now she had even held out her hand to him and inquired about the progress of his work he was overwhelmed with business but so great was his pleasure in talking with her that he lingered longer than he would have deemed right under any other circumstances and regarded it as an unpleasant interruption when barine for whom his heart had throbbed so warmly only yesterday entered the tablinum the young beauty was by no means content with a brief greeting but drew helena entirely away from him never had he seen her embrace and kiss her sister so passionately as while hurriedly telling her that she had come to bid farewell to the loved ones in her grandparents house berenike had arrived with her but went first to the old couple while barine was telling helena and gorgias also why all this plan had been formed so hastily gorgias was silently comparing the two sisters he found it natural that he had once believed that he loved barine but she would not have been a fitting mistress of his house life at her side would have been a chain of jealous emotions and anxieties and her stimulating remarks and searching questions which demanded absolute attention would not have permitted him after his return home wearied by arduous toil to find the rest for which he longed his eye wandered from her to her sister as if testing the space between two newly erected pillars and barine who had noticed his strange manner suddenly laughed merrily and asked whether they might know what building was occupying his thoughts while a good friend was telling him that the pleasant hours in her house were over gorgias started and the apology he stammered showed so plainly how inattentively he had listened that barine would have had good reason to feel offended but one glance at her sister and another at him enabled her speedily to guess the truth she was pleased for she esteemed gorgias and had secretly feared that she might be forced to grieve him by a refusal but he seemed as if created for her sister her arrival had probably interrupted them so turning to helena she exclaimed i must see my mother and our grandparents meanwhile entertain our friend here we know each other well he is one of the few men who can be trusted that is my honest opinion gorgias and i say it to you also helena with these words she nodded to both and gorgias was again alone with the maiden whom he loved it was difficult to begin the conversation anew and when spite of many efforts it would not flow freely the shout of the overseer which reached his ear through the opening of the roof urging the men to work was like a deliverance promising to return again soon as eagerly as if he had been requested to do so he took his leave and opened the door leading into the adjoining room but on the threshold he started back and helena who had followed him did the same for there stood his friend dion and barine's beautiful head lay on his breast while his hand rested as if in benediction on her fair hair and no gorgias was not mistaken the slender frame of the lovely woman whose exuberant vivacity had so often borne him and others away with it trembled as if shaken by deep and painful emotion 
when dion perceived his friend and barine raised her head turning her face towards him it was indeed wet with tears but their source could not be sorrow for her blue eyes were sparkling with a happy light yet gorgias found something in her features which he was unable to express in words the reflection of the ardent gratitude that had taken possession of her soul and filled it absolutely while seeking the architect dion had met barine who was on her way to her grandparents and what he had dreaded the day before happened the first glance from her eyes which met his forced the decisive question from his lips in brief earnest words he confessed his love for her and his desire to make her his own as the pride and ornament of his house then in the intensity of her bliss her eyes overflowed and under the spell of a great miracle wrought in her behalf she found no words to answer but dion had approached clasped her right hand in both of his and frankly acknowledged how with the image of his strict mother before his eyes he had wavered and hesitated until love had overmastered him now full of the warmest confidence he asked whether she would consent to rule as mistress of his home the honour and ornament of his ancient name he knew that her heart was his but he must hear one thing more from her lips here she had interrupted him with the cry this one thing that your wife in joy and in sorrow will live for you and you alone the whole world can vanish for her now that you have raised her to your side and she is yours after this assurance which sounded like an oath dion felt as if a heavy burden had fallen from his heart and clasping her in his arms with passionate tenderness he repeated in joy and in sorrow thus gorgias and helena had surprised them and the architect felt for the first time that there is no distinction between our own happiness and that of those whom we love his friend helena seemed to have the same feeling when she saw what this day had given her sister and the philosopher's house so lately shattered by anxiety and many a fear would soon ring with voices uttering joyous congratulations the architect no longer felt that he had a place in this circle which was now pervaded by a great common joy and after dion made a brief explanation gorgias's voice was soon heard outside loudly issuing orders to the workmen End of chapter eight chapter nine of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine gorgias went to his work without delay when the twin statues were only waiting to be erected in front of the theatre of dionysus dion sought him some impulse urged him to talk to his old friend before leaving the city with his betrothed bride since they parted the latter had accomplished the impossible for the building of the wall on the coma ordered by antony was commenced the restoration of the little palace at the point and many other things connected with the decoration of the triumphal arches were arranged his able and alert foreman found it difficult to follow him as he dictated order after order in his writing tablet the conversation with his friend was not a long one for dion had promised barine and her mother to accompany them to the country notwithstanding the betrothal they were to start that very day for caesarion had called upon barine twice that morning she had not received him but the unfortunate youth's conduct induced her to hasten the preparations for her departure to avoid attracting attention they were to use archibius's large travelling chariot and nile boat although dion's were no less comfortable the marriage was to take place in the abode of peace the young alexandrian's own ship which was to convey the newly wedded pair to alexandria bore the name of pytho the goddess of persuasion for dion liked to be reminded of his oratorical powers in the council henceforward it would be called the barine and was to receive many an embellishment dion confided to his friend what he had learned in relation to the fate of the queen and the fleet and notwithstanding the urgency of the claims upon gorgias's time 
he lingered to discuss the future destiny of the city and her threatened liberty for these things lay nearest to his heart fortunately cried dion i followed my inclination now it seems to me that duty commands every true man to make his own house a nursery for the cultivation of the sentiments which he inherited from his forefathers and which must not die so long as there are macedonian citizens in alexandria we must submit if the superior might of rome renders egypt a province of the republic but we can preserve to our city and her council the lion's share of their freedom whatever may be the development of affairs we are and shall remain the source whence rome draws the largest share of the knowledge which enriches her brain and the art which adorns her rude life replied gorgias if she is free to crush us without pity she will fare i think like the maiden who raises her foot to trample on a beautiful rare flower and then withdraws it because it would be a crime to destroy so exquisite a work of the creator and what does the flower owe to your maiden cried dion or our city to rome let us meet her claims with dignified resolution then i think we shall not have the worst evils to fear let us hope so but my friend keep your eyes open for other than roman foes now that it will become known that you do not love her beware of iris there is something about her which reminds me of the jackal jealousy i believe she would be capable of the worst yet dion interrupted charmian will soften whatever injury iris plans to do me and though i cannot rely much upon my uncle archibius is above both and favours us and our marriage gorgias uttered a sigh of relief and exclaimed then on to happiness and you must also begin to provide for yours replied dion warmly forbid your heart to continue this wandering nomad life the tent which the wind blows down is not fit for the architect's permanent residence build yourself a fine house which will defy storms as you built my palace i shall not grudge it and have already said the times demand it i will remember the advice replied gorgias but six eyes are again bent upon me for direction there are so many important things to be done while we waste the hours in building triumphal arches for the defeated trophies for an overthrow but your uncle has just issued orders to complete the work in the most magnificent style the ways of destiny and the great are dark may the brightest sunshine illumine yours a prosperous journey we shall hear of course when you celebrate the wedding and if i can i shall join you in the hymenaeus lucky fellow that you are now i am summoned from over yonder may castor and pollux and all the gods favourable to travel aphrodite and all the loves attend your trip to irenia and protect you in the realm of eros and hymen with these words the warm-hearted man clasped his friend to his breast for the first time dion cordially responded and at last shook his hard right hand with the exclamation farewell then till we meet in irenia on the wedding day you dear faithful fellow then he entered the chariot which stood waiting and gorgias gazed after him thoughtfully the hyacinthine purple cloak which dion wore that day had not vanished from his sight when a loud crashing rattling and roaring arose behind him a hastily erected scaffold which was to support the pulleys for raising the statues had collapsed the damage could be easily repaired but the accident aroused a troubled feeling in the architect's mind he was a child of his time a period when duty commanded the prudent man to heed omens experience also taught him that when such a thing happened in his work something unpleasant was apt to occur within the circle of his friends the veil of the future concealed what might be in store for the beloved couple but he resolved to keep his eyes open on dion's behalf and to request archibius to do the same the pressure of work however soon silenced the sense of uneasiness the damage was speedily repaired and later gorgias sometimes with one sometimes with another tablet or roll of manuscript in his hand issued the most varied orders 
gradually the light of this dismal day faded ere the night which threatened to bring rain and storm closed in he again rode on his mule to the bruchium to overlook the progress of the work in the various buildings and give additional directions for the labour was to be continued during the night the north wind was now blowing so violently from the sea that it was difficult to keep the torches and lamps lighted the gale drove the drops of rain into his face and a glance northward showed him masses of black clouds beyond the harbour and the lighthouse this indicated a bad night and again the boding sense of coming misfortune stole over him yet he set to work swiftly and prudently helping with his own hands when occasion required night closed in not a star was visible in the sky and the air chilled by the north wind grew so cold that gorgias at last permitted his body slave to wrap his cloak around him while drawing the hood over his head he gazed at a procession of litters and men moving towards lochias perhaps the queen's children were returning home from some expedition but probably they were rather private citizens on their way to some festival celebrating the victory for every one now believed in a great battle and a successful issue of the war this was proved by the shouts and cheers of the people who spite of the storm were still moving to and fro near the harbour the last of the torch-bearers had just passed gorgias and he had told himself that a train of litters belonging to the royal family would not move through the darkness so faintly lighted when a single man bearing in his hand a lantern whose flickering rays shone on his wrinkled face approached rapidly from the opposite direction it was old fricks didymus's house-slave with whom the architect had become acquainted while the aged scholar was composing the inscription for the odeum which gorgias had erected the aged servant had brought him many alterations of his master's first sketch and gorgias had reminded him of it the previous day the workmen by whom the statues had been raised to the pedestal amid the bright glare of torches to the accompaniment of a regular chant had just dropped the ropes windlasses and levers when the architect recognized the slave what did the old man want at so late an hour on this dark night the fall of the scaffold again returned to his mind was the slave seeking for a member of the family did helena need assistance he stopped the grey-haired man who answered his question with a heavy sigh followed by the maxim misfortunes come in pairs like oxen then he continued yesterday there was great anxiety to-day when there was so much rejoicing on account of barine i thought directly sorrow follows joy and the second misfortune won't be spared us and so it proved gorgias anxiously begged him to relate what had happened and the old man drawing nearer whispered that the pupil and assistant of didymus young philatus of amphissa a student and moreover a courteous young man of excellent family had gone to a banquet to which antyllus the son of antony had invited several of his classmates this had already happened several times and he bricks had warned him for when the lowly associate with the lofty the lowly rarely escape kicks and blows the young fellow who usually had behaved no worse than the other ephebi had always returned from such festivities with a flushed face and unsteady steps but to-night he had not even reached his room in the upper story he had darted into the house as though pursued by the watch and while trying to rush up the stairs it was really only a ladder he had made a misstep and fell he bricks did not believe that he was hurt for none of his limbs ached even when they were pulled and stretched and dionysus kindly protected drunkards but some demon must have taken possession of him for he howled and groaned continually and would answer no questions true he was aware from the festivals of dionysus that the young man was one of those who when intoxicated weep and lament but this time something unusual must have occurred for in the first place his handsome face was coloured black and looked hideous since his tears had washed away the soot in many places and then he talked nothing but a confused jargon it was a pity 
when an attempt was made with the help of the garden slave to carry him to his room he dealt blows and kicks like a lunatic didymus now also believed that he was possessed by demons as often happens to those who in falling strike their heads against the ground and thus wake the demons in the earth well yes they might be demons but only those of wine the student was just crazy drunk as people say but the old gentleman was very fond of his pupil and had ordered him plyrix to go to olympus who ever since he could remember had been the family physician the queen's leech asked gorgias disapprovingly and when the slave assented the architect exclaimed in a positive tone it is not right to force the old man out of doors in such a north wind age is not specially considerate to age now that the statues stand yonder i can leave my post for half an hour and will go with you i don't think a leech is needed to drive out these demons true my lord true cried the slave but olympus is our friend he visits few patients but he will come to our house in any weather he has litters chariots and splendid mules the queen gives him whatever is best and most comfortable he is skilful and perhaps can render speedy help people must use what they have only where it is necessary replied the architect there are my two mules follow me on the second if i don't drive out the demons you will have plenty of time to trot after olympus this proposal pleased the old slave and a short time after gorgias entered the venerable philosopher's tablinum helena welcomed him like an intimate friend whenever he appeared she thought the peril was half over didymus too greeted him warmly and conducted him to the little room where the youth possessed by demons lay on a divan he was still groaning and whimpering tears were streaming down his cheeks and whenever any member of the household approached he pushed him away when gorgias held his hands and sternly ordered him to confess what wrong he had done he sobbed out that he was the most ungrateful wretch on earth his baseness would ruin his kind parents himself and all his friends then he accused himself of having caused the destruction of didymus's granddaughter he would not have gone to antillus again had not his recent generosity bound him to him but now he must atone ay atone then as if completely crushed he continued to mumble the word atone and for a time nothing more could be won from him didymus however had the key to the last sentence a few weeks before philotus and several other pupils of the rhetorician whose lectures in the museum he attended had been invited to breakfast with antyllus when the young student loudly admired the beautiful gold and silver beakers in which the wine was served the reckless host cried they are yours take them with you when the guests departed the cup-bearer asked philotus who had been far from taking the gift seriously to receive his property antyllus had intended to bestow the goblets but he advised the youth to let him pay their value in money for among them were several ancient pieces of most artistic workmanship which antony the extravagant young fellow's father might perhaps be unwilling to lose thereupon several rolls of gold solidi were paid to the astonished student and they had been of little real benefit since they had made it possible for him to keep pace with his wealthy and aristocratic classmates and share many of their extravagances yet he had not ceased to fulfil his duty to didymus though he sometimes turned night into day he gave no serious cause for reproof small youthful errors were willingly pardoned for he was a good-looking merry young fellow who knew how to make himself agreeable to the entire household even to the women what had befallen the poor youth that day didymus was filled with compassion for him and though he gladly welcomed gorgias he gave him to understand that the leech's absence vexed him but during a long bachelor career in alexandria a city ever gracious to the gifts of bacchus gorgias had become familiar with attacks like those of philotus and their treatment and after several jars of water had been brought and he had been left alone a short time with the sufferer the philosopher secretly rejoiced that he had not summoned the grey-haired leech into the stormy night for gorgias led forth his pupil with dripping hair it is true but in a state of rapid convalescence the youth's handsome face was freed from soot but his eyes were bent in confusion on the ground and he sometimes pressed his hand upon his aching brow 
it needed all the old philosopher's skill and persuasion to induce him to speak and philotus before he began begged helena to leave the room he intended to adhere strictly to the truth though he feared that the reckless deed into which he had suffered himself to be drawn might have a fatal effect upon his future life besides he hoped to obtain wise counsel from the architect to whom he owed his speedy recovery and whose grave kindly manner inspired him with confidence and moreover he was so greatly indebted to didymus that duty required him to make a frank confession yet he dared not acknowledge one of the principal motives of his foolish act the plot into which he had been led was directed against barine whom he had long imagined he loved with all the fervour of his twenty years but just before he went to the fatal banquet he had heard that the young beauty was betrothed to dion this had wounded him deeply for in many a quiet hour it had seemed possible to win her for himself and lead her as his wife to his home in amphissa he was very little younger than she and if his parents once saw her they could not fail to approve his choice and the people in amphissa they would have gazed at barine as if she were a goddess and now this fine gentleman had come to crush his fairest hopes no word of love had ever been exchanged between him and barine but how kindly she had always looked at him how willingly she had accepted trivial services now she was lost at first this had merely saddened him but after he had drunk the wine and antyllus antony's son in the presence of the revellers over whom caesarion presided as symposiarch director of the banquet had accused barine of capturing hearts by magic spells he had arrived at the conviction that he too had been shamefully allured and betrayed he had served for a toy he said to himself unless she had really loved him and merely preferred dion on account of his wealth in any case he felt justified in cherishing resentment against barine and with the number of goblets which he drained his jealous rage increased when urged to join in the escapade which now burdened his conscience he consented with a burning brain in order to punish her for the wrong which in his heated imagination she had done him all this he withheld from the older men and merely briefly described the splendid banquet which caesarion pallid and listless as ever had directed and antyllus especially had enlivened with the most reckless mirth the king of kings and antony's son had escaped from their tutors on the pretext of a hunting excursion and the chief huntsman had not grudged them the pleasure only they were obliged to promise him that they would be ready to set out for the desert early the next morning when after the banquet the mixing vessels were brought out and the beakers were filled more rapidly antyllus whispered several times to caesarion and then turned the conversation upon barine the fairest of the fair destined by the immortals for the greatest and highest of mankind this was the king of kings caesarion and he also claimed the favour of the gods for himself but everybody knew that aphrodite deemed herself greater than the highest of kings and therefore barine ventured to close her doors upon their august symposiarch in a manner which could not fail to be unendurable not only to him but to all the youth of alexandria whoever boasted of being one of the ephebi might well clench his fist with indignation when he heard that the insolent beauty kept young men at a distance because she considered only the older ones worthy of her notice this must not be the ephebi of alexandria must make her feel the power of youth this was the more urgently demanded because caesarion would thereby be led to the goal of his wishes barine was going into the country that very evening insulted eros himself was smoothing their way he commanded them to attack the arrogant fair one's carriage and lead her to him who sought her in the name of youth in order to show her that the hearts of the ephebi whom she disdainfully rejected glowed more ardently than those of the older men on whom she bestowed her favours here gorgias interrupted the speaker with a loud cry of indignation but old didymus's eyes seemed to be fairly starting from their sockets as he hoarsely shouted an impatient go on and philotus now completely sobered described with increasing animation the wonderful change that had taken place in the quiet caesarion as if some magic spell had been at work 
for scarcely had the revellers greeted antyllus's words with shouts of joy declaring themselves ready to avenge insulted youth upon barine than the king of kings suddenly sprang from the cushions on which he had listlessly reclined and with flashing eyes shouted that whoever called himself his friend must aid him in the attack here he was urged to still greater haste by another impatient go on from his master and hurriedly continued his story describing how they had blackened their faces and armed themselves with antyllus's swords and lances as the sun was setting they went in a covered boat through the agathodamon canal to lake mariatus everything must have been arranged in advance for they landed precisely at the right hour as during the trip they had kept up their courage by swallowing the most fiery wine philotas had staggered on shore with difficulty and then been dragged forward by the others after this he knew nothing more except that he had rushed with the rest upon a large harmamaxa a closed asiatic travelling carriage with four wheels and in so doing fell when he rose from the earth all was over as if in a dream he saw scythians and other guardians of the peace seize antyllus while caesarion was struggling on the ground with another man if he was not mistaken it was dion barine's betrothed husband these communications were interrupted by many exclamations of impatience and wrath but now didymus fairly frantic with alarm cried and the child barine but when philotas's sole reply to this question was a silent shake of the head indignation conquered the old philosopher and clutching his pupil's chiton with both hands he shook him violently exclaiming furiously you don't know scoundrel instead of defending her who should be dear to you as a child of this household you joined the rascally scorners of morality and law as the accomplice of this waylayer in purple here the architect soothed the enraged old man with expostulations and the assertion that everything must now yield to the necessity of searching for barine and dion he did not know which way to turn in the amount of labour pressing upon him but he would have a hasty talk with the foreman and then try to find his friend and i cried the old man must go at once to the unfortunate child my cloak fricks my sandals in spite of gorgias's counsel to remember his age and the inclement weather he cried angrily i am going i say if the tempest hurls me to the earth and the bolts of zeus strike me so be it one misfortune more or less matters little in a life which has been a chain of heavy blows of fate i buried three sons in the prime of manhood and two have been slain in battle barine the joy of my heart i myself fool that i was bound to the scoundrel who blasted her joyous existence and now that i believe she would be protected from trouble and misconstruction by the side of a worthy husband these infamous rascals whose birth protects them from vengeance have wounded perhaps killed her betrothed lover they trample in the dust her fair name and my white hair fricks my hat and staff the storm had long been raging around the house which stood close by the sea and the sailcloth awning which was stretched over the impluvium noisily rattled the metal rings that confined it now so violent a gust swept from room to room that two of the flames in the three-branched lamp went out the door of the house had been opened and drenched with rain a hood drawn over his black head barine's nubian doorkeeper crossed the threshold he presented a pitiable spectacle and at first could find no answer to the greetings and questions of the men who had been joined by helena her grandmother leaning on her arm his rapid walk against the fury of the storm had fairly taken away his breath he had little however to tell barine merely sent a message to her relatives that no matter what tales rumour might bring she and her mother were unhurt dion had received a wound in the shoulder but it was not serious her grandparents need have no anxiety the attack had completely failed doris who was deaf had listened vainly holding her hand to her ear to catch this report and didymus now told his granddaughter as much as he deemed it advisable for her to know that she might communicate it to her grandmother who understood the movements of her lips the old man was rejoiced to learn that his granddaughter had escaped so great a peril uninj uninjured yet he was still burdened by sore anxiety 
the architect too feared the worst but by dint of assuring him that he would return at once with full details when he had ascertained the fate of dion and his betrothed bride he finally persuaded the old man to give up the night walk through the tempest philotus with tears in his eyes begged them to accept his services as messenger or for any other purpose but didymus ordered him to go to bed an opportunity would be found to enable him to atone for the offence so recklessly committed the scholar's peaceful home was deprived of its nocturnal repose and when gorgias had gone and didymus had refused helena's request to have the aged porter take her to her sister the old man remained alone with his wife in the tablinum she had been told nothing except that thebes had attacked her granddaughter barine and slightly wounded her lover but her own heart and the manner of the husband at whose side she had grown grey showed that many things were being concealed she longed to know the story more fully but it was difficult for didymus to talk a long time in a loud tone so she silenced her desire to learn the whole truth but in order to await the architect's report they did not go to rest didymus had sunk into an armchair and dora sat near at her spindle but without drawing any threads from her distaff when she heard her husband sigh and saw him burying his face in his hands she limped nearer to him difficult as it was for her to move and stroked his head now nearly bald with her hand then she uttered soothing words and as the anxious troubled expression did not yet pass from his wrinkled face she reminded him in faltering yet tender tones how often they had thought they must despair and yet everything had resulted well ah husband she added i know full well that the clouds hanging over us are very black and i cannot even see them clearly because you show them at such a distance yet i feel that they threaten us with sore tribulation but after all what harm can they do us if we only keep close together we two old people and the children of the children whom hades rent from us we need only to grow old to perceive that life has a head with many faces the ugly one of to-day can last no longer than you can keep that deeply furrowed brow but you need not coerce yourself for my sake husband let it be so i need merely close my eyes to see how smooth and beautiful it was in youth and how pleasant it will look when better days say here we are didymus with a mournful smile kissed her grey hair and shouted into her left ear which was a little less deaf than the other how young you are still wife End of chapter nine